Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. What I want to cover in today's video is something called aerodynamic downforce balance. Now, that sounds a very esoteric topic, but it's critically important if you are modifying the aerodynamics of your road or race car. Let's take a look. So let's think about downforce. In fact, lift is far more common, but it's easy to understand if we talk about downforce. Downforce is the aerodynamic pushing down at the back of the car and the front of the car. Now, let's imagine we have equal downforce front and back. As we go faster, the downforce increases and increases rapidly with speed, but the balance stays the same. We've got the same amount at the back and at the front. But what if it's not like that? What if we have more downforce at the front than the back? We go faster and faster, we get more and more downforce at the front, and in relative terms, less and less at the back. That's going to give you high-speed oversteer. That's not much fun, is it? What if we turn it around? What if we have more and more downforce at the back and less and less at the front as we go faster? That will give you high-speed understeer. That's preferable to high-speed oversteer, but it would be better if it didn't do either of those things. Now, this is completely different to suspension setup. Suspension setup doesn't change with speed. Aerodynamic setup changes with speed, and it changes rapidly with speed. Double the speed, four times the forces. So you can see how important it really is. So why is it so important? Well, tire grip depends largely on vertical load. The more you push the tire down into the pavement, the better it sticks to the road. Two reasons for that. Molecular attraction, a bit like how a post-it note sticks to a piece of paper. If you push on it more firmly, you can, when you peel it off, it's, you'll find it's stuck better. And also, when tyres get pushed down into the road, the rubber deforms into all the tiny valleys and peaks in the road, and that gives a mechanical grip. Harder to push the tyre across if it's deformed into all of those little irregularities. Now, if you add weight to the car, you might think, well, that's going to push the tyres down. Isn't that going to give me more grip? No, because if you add weight, you've also got to accelerate that weight around the corners. And the increased grip by being pushed down exactly offsets the extra weight you've got to get around the corner. So it doesn't give you any advantage. But in aerodynamics, you get the push downwards from that downforce with no extra weight. And that gives you an enormous advantage in grip. You don't have any extra weight to accelerate around the corner, but you've got a lot more grip because of the push down of the tyre. And if you're thinking, well, yeah, that's fine for racing cars, but I have a road car. How does that affect me? It affects you in exactly the same way. It is a complete misconception to think that lift and downforce are not relevant to road cars. They are extraordinarily relevant. Even at speeds of 100 kilometres an hour, they are relevant. If you have aerodynamic lift, your car is going to be having less grip and also probably less stability as well. These things are relevant to all cars that are driven at normal speeds. So as I said, aerodynamic downforce gives you that extra vertical weight effectiveness without actually adding any weight to the car. You get increased tyre grip. It's like getting something for nothing. You get increased tyre grip with almost no downsides at all. It's a very good thing. The other reason that aerodynamic downforce force works so well is that, it, that there are lots of other things occurring. And so if you get, say, 50 pounds of downforce on the front, you might say, well, that's not very much. If my car weighs, you know, thousands of pounds, what's the, how, how much will 50 pounds make any difference? But it does, and you can feel it. And one of the reasons that downforce makes a disproportionate impact on vehicle dynamics is because when we're measuring aerodynamic coefficients, we're measuring steady state ones. But the car isn't operating in a steady state environment. It's operating in an environment that's dynamic, changing all the time. 
And there, there are various uh, technical papers that have been written on this topic. And, and the consensus is largely that aerodynamic lift can discombobulate the suspension. You've got variations occurring, very rapid variations occurring in lift behaviours, and they can start exciting the, the, the suspension. And that's one reason why um, getting downforce, even if the numbers are small, makes a difference you can immediately feel. So because you have oscillatory changing behaviours in aerodynamics, that can also start exciting suspension behaviours as well. Plenty more on that in my book, but take it from me, even if you get 50 or 100 pounds downforce, you can immediately feel the difference on a car. And even if you reduce lift by that much, you can immediately feel the difference. It's not something that's just abstract and theoretical. This is something that can be immediately felt on the road or the track. So let's go back to aerodynamic downforce. And let's give an example. Let's say that the car has a 50-50 weight distribution front and back. And let's say that suspension is set up to make the car quite neutral. It doesn't understeer much. It doesn't oversteer much. And then let's add front downforce via a curved undertray, such as shown here. Now, as you go faster, the front will develop more and more downforce. The rear will not. We've made no change at the back. If the front develops downforce and the rear does not, the faster you go, the more likely this otherwise neutrally handling car will want to oversteer at high speed. Now, that's just not theoretical, that's a reality. A swerve and recover at 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, 120 kilometers an hour, 70 miles an hour is much more likely to result in a spin if you have added front downforce but you have done nothing at the back. Okay, start thinking about it. It's a bit like putting on uh, a bigger rear anti-roll bar, which gets bigger as you go faster. All right, it's, it's really hard to initially get your head around, but it's really, really important in terms of especially high-speed handling. So as I say, at 35 miles an hour, that car we've added the front under tray to will feel just the same as it did before because the aerodynamics really aren't working at that low speed. But at 60 miles an hour, that front under trail will be working, developing downforce, but nothing's happening at the back. You've got more front grip, but you have not got more rear grip. And that can be quite dangerous. What if we add a, a front splitter? It's even worse, because now we're adding downforce ahead of the front axle line. If we push down on that front splitter, because that splitter is well ahead of the front axle line, we are trying to lift the back up. So not only do we get more front downforce and therefore front grip, we get less grip at the back than we would have if the splitter hadn't been there. Pushing down ahead of the front axle line will lift the back of the car. You can see you've got to start being quite careful if you otherwise just putting random stuff on your car. Oh yeah, big front splitter, that'll make things better. It might make things worse in terms of actual high speed handling. These things are not abstract. These things are not imaginary. These things are real. So what I prefer to do by far is to try to add downforce in between the front and the rear axle lines. And the best way of doing that is a full length under tray with a little rear diffuser, a diffuser going up at the back. It doesn't need strakes, it just needs to curve up at the back. That increases the speed of airflow under the car. Increased speed of airflow means lower pressure, pulling the car downwards. And if we can pull the car downwards between the front and rear axle lines, we get rid of, we, we no longer have a lot of the problems I've been discussing. We're not developing rear lift by front downforce or anything like that. We're pulling both the front and the back downwards. We talked about a front splitter that causes rear lift because its center of pressure is ahead of the front axle. But what about a rear wing? The wing is located behind the rear axle line, so that is creating front lift. Not only is it creating rear downforce, if it's a true wing being operated correctly, it's creating front lift. Now, you might think, well, this is all getting really hard. The key thing to think of, if we do something at the front to reduce lift or to give downforce, we must do something at the back as well. Don't try to cure high-speed handling ills by aerodynamic changes. 
make the car handle neutrally at lower speeds by suspension changes, and then as speeds increase, have equal front and rear downforce so that we don't start to change the handling characteristics of the car through aerodynamics. We just improve the handling characteristics of the car. We don't change them. We don't change neutral to understeer or neutral to oversteer. We keep it neutral, but the levels get higher because of the downforce. Now, all modern cars from the factory are deliberately set up so there's more front lift than rear lift. All right, they've got, I'm saying lift now rather than downforce because most cars have got lift. And the reason they set them up for more front lift than rear lift is they want it to start to understeer at high speed. The alternative is high speed aerodynamic oversteer and that kills people. And there's a really good example and that is the first Audi TT was a car with a lot of rear lift. It didn't have the spoiler shown, the rear spoiler shown in this image. If we think of the airflow wrapping around that curve there, lift, just like an aircraft wing, and then wrapping around the curve there before the spoiler was present, more lift. This is a car that actually in high speed crashes killed several people, including an ex-champion rally driver. The uh, car was recalled by Audi, the rear spoiler was fitted, they also made some suspension changes, but the, the key thing from this video's point of view is that rear spoiler was fitted to reduce rear lift. And that was a, a salutary lesson for, for car aerodynamicists, because they suddenly saw uh, what could really happen when they were releasing cars with a lot of rear lift. All cars uh, these days that I'm aware of have more front lift than rear lift, so we don't have any high speed oversteer. And if you do have a choice in setting up your car, that is what I would suggest you do. I said earlier, make sure they're equal front and rear, but if they're going to be unequal, either add more downforce at the back than you are adding at the front, or have uh, more front lift than rear lift, depending on which way you're thinking about it. Here's a good example of a, a Porsche which has deployable front and rear spoilers. Without the spoilers deployed at top speed, I can't remember, I think it was about 300 kilometers an hour, it had 56 kilograms lift at the front and no kilograms lift at the back. So it had more front lift than rear lift. This is typically how cars are set up. With the front and rear spoilers deployed, it had 19 kilograms of front lift, so way, way down from the 56, and it had minus 56 at the back, in other words, downforce at the back. So they still set it up for high speed uh, aerodynamic uh, understeer rather than high speed aerodynamic oversteer, even a, a performance sporting car like this. So where does that leave us? First thing, aerodynamic balance refer, refers to the split between front and rear downforce or lift. How much downforce do we have at the back compared with how much downforce do we have at the front as speeds grow? Or how much lift do we have at the back compared with how much lift we have at the front again as speeds uh, increase? Did I say slow? Increase. Aerodynamic balance is easily affected by adding aerodynamic elements like wings, spoilers, under trays, and splitters. And these are real effects that you can feel and will change the handling behavior of the car. Because aerodynamic forces increase quickly with speed, it is the high speed handling that will be most affected by incorrect aerodynamic balance. The, um, the, 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 the behavior of the car where you're least likely to be able to catch it because it's happening at the highest possible speeds. When you make aerodynamic changes to your car, you must be aware of how these changes may affect balance. If you do something at the back, what are you doing at the front to balance that? If you do something at the front, what are you doing at the back? And remember, a lot of aerodynamic attachments, wings located behind rear wheels, splitters located ahead of front wheels, reduce the effectiveness at the other end. Okay, they've got a negative effect at the other end. And that's why I like uh, full length under trays because they develop the downforce between the axle lines. And so you're not upsetting one end compared to the other uh, to anywhere near the same degree. Now, if you're thinking, okay, well that's okay, but how do we measure these things? You know, how do we know how much downforce the split is developing at the front or the wings developing at the back? How do we know how it's affecting the other end? All of these things can be measured. 
All of these things can be measured easily and cheaply. You can measure lift, you can measure downforce on the road or track. It's dead easy and it's dead accurate too. All covered in my book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. And I've also got some extracts from some uh, eminent car aerodynamicists talking about this very issue. How do you set up the aerodynamic balance, especially of a road car? Uh, I've got some really interesting feedback and perspectives on that. All in the book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. The book's available now. It's not a cheap book. It's a big book, 500 pages, but it's the single resource you need if you are aerodynamically developing or modifying your car for the road or for the track. Thank you.